Hey there, welcome back to the channel. Today I want to do a follow-up to a video I did last week on the performance of interrupts. Last week, if you recall, I did the Meadow F7 and I had talked about the differences in some other platforms and I figured while I've got everything out and set up, let's try to do some tests on a couple of other platforms. First, let's go take a look at the Arduino version of this test. You can see here that I've got some Arduino code. It's a simple sketch in setup. I set up the output pin, the input pin, and then I attach an interrupt to that input pin on a rising edge. When that interrupt occurs, we call this ISR here, which just takes the output, raises it high, and then goes back low. Functionally the exact same thing that we did on the F7 Meadow. It's very important to note, though, that this is, first of all, C, not C sharp, so it is not managed code. It does not have a runtime behind it. It also does not have an operating system at all. The only thing this microcontroller is going to be doing is this. It's not managing any other system state, not looking at anything else. Therefore, it's really not an apples to apples comparison on the performance between the two but it does give us at least a measurement that we can go, okay, I see how fast this can go. Let me compile this and deploy it to the connected device. So what we have is we've got an Arduino Uno. We've got ground that comes over here to this ground rail and then to a resistor that's pulling the input down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up the function generator and we're going to hook it to the ground and to that input. So now we should get pulses from it that are driving that interrupt line high. We then want to hook up our scope so that we can measure those. And then we want to hook up the scope to look at the output. All right, now let's take a look at the scope. So take a look at the waveform here. You can see, just like before, we've got our rising interrupt and then our response. And the difference between the rise and the response looks like it's about seven microseconds. Now, you can see that occasionally this magenta pulse actually moves over here to the right, which actually surprises me since this is doing nothing else I actually don't have an explanation offhand for why it is occasionally getting slow interrupts. The other thing we can take a look at is how wide is that pulse. So it's about a 4.2 microsecond pulse. To try to get a feel for the jitter, I've turned on persistence for the waveform. You can see the end of this can be as late as right about here. I don't see anything later than that. And if the pulse height is about four point or the pulse width is about 4.2 microseconds, that looks like our jitter. Well, let's see the beginning of this latest one would be 17 minus 4.2, so let's call that 13. So, can have a minimum of about seven, a maximum of about 13. So, it's got a jitter of somewhere around five microseconds. All right, now I'm gonna tear this apart and set up a Raspberry Pi and we can run this test again. All right, so I have a Raspberry Pi 5 hooked up here. You can see that I've got the ground hooked up and then GPIOs 21 and 20. And the circuit over here is identical to what I just used on the Arduino. And the signal generator and the oscilloscope are already hooked up. So this is the setup. It's really, really the same as what we had done before. But let's go take a look at the code because to me, this is the more interesting part. If you take a look at this code, this is the test that we did on the F7 Feather. I basically just copied all of this code and put it into another application. You can see this one. This was the previous one. 
targeting the F7 Feather. Now I'm targeting Raspberry Pi, but the code is effectively identical. The only thing that changed is I'm using GPIOs 20 and 21, whereas here I used 5 and 6 on the Meadow. So my code is 100% transportable. I'm just taking the same thing, moving it over, changing what pins that I want to use, and running the exact same application. So now I can build this application. All right, so let's take a look at what we've got here. I have one folder from some other tests that I've been running. I'm going to make a directory for our tests. And you can see it is empty. Now I'm going to copy all of the output. So this is the output from the release folder from our test. You can see we've got this interrupts folder and it is empty. So now I'll take all of this code, just copy it over. This is my simple deployment here. And now I change back here. You can see code now exists and we run my timing tests DLO. All right, so now let's bring up the scope and it's running. Now it's a little bit hard to see right here in the middle is where our outputs are. I've not changed the settings on the scope from the uh, Arduino. So you can see that this was our delay before. So our interrupt delay on the Raspberry Pi 5 is significantly longer, but look how short these pulses are before we actually had something that you could, you know, measure with the cursors. But before we go look at that, first let's get a measurement of this. You can also see that there's quite a bit of jitter. It's moving around quite a bit. So I'm going to turn on persistence first so we can plot a bunch of those. And where they tend to be mostly hitting is somewhere around here, maybe a little earlier. So it looks like the reaction time on this is about, you know, somewhere around 33, 35 microseconds. There's quite a bit of difference here. The minimum seems to be somewhere right around here. So let's call that 31. And I see outliers all the way out. Yeah, it's hard to see on this screen. It's a little easier to see on the scope itself, but somewhere around here. So around 51. So really somewhere around a 20 microsecond jitter. And just occasionally you'll see a pulse that is really, really long. So we get this uh, real, the short pulse most of the time, but occasionally I see them where they're, you know, 20 microseconds, somewhere in that neighborhood. So there's occasionally something is happening where the system is pausing long enough after we turn it on, but before we turn it off for something going on again. This is a full Raspberry Pi Ubuntu build, so it's got Wi-Fi going on right now. It's got a whole bunch of other things that it's doing. So it's not unexpected for there to be this kind of jitter. So now let's zoom in and take a look at just how, how fast those pulses are. What I'm going to do is change the trigger to channel 2 on that purple so that we can zoom in on those. So you can see what I'm measuring here is not the full width of that pulse. Really, I'm measuring the width from when it starts rising. So that's when the signal comes in to when the signal starts going back down again. That tailing edge is really a, the electrical uh, equivalent here. This is how fast from when we tell it to turn on to when we tell it turn back off. And that number is 26 nanoseconds. So if you need short pulses, this is fantastic. But it does have a lot of jitter, and it is, in fact, quite a bit slower in reaction time uh, com as compared to the Arduino. 
Again, it's not an apples to apples comparison, so I don't really like putting them side by side and going, look, this one is better, but it gives you some data points on the performance uh, characteristics of the two. While I'm in here, I actually have a Raspberry Pi Zero 2 uh, on my desk, so let's give that one a try as well. Okay, so you can see I've swapped out for a Raspberry Pi Zero. This is a Zero 2W. And let's go take a look and see how it behaves. So I'm going to SSH in. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to make a directory called interrupt. You can see it's empty. And I have connected to it. The folder now exists. Now I'm going to copy this exact same binary that was running on the Raspberry Pi 5. So this is zero code changes. In fact, like I say, it's the exact same compiled binary. We're going to transfer it over. And then we're going to do .NET. Uh, what did I call this again? Pi timing tests. And run it. You can see it's not using GPIOD, but it's using SysFS. And let's take a look at the timing here. So you can see the behavior. It's doing the same thing, not with the same timings, but the same exact binary is running uh, on this Pi Zero that was running on the Pi 5. So that's an important distinction here. And you can see, kind of like on the Meadow, it's moving around quite a bit, but somewhere right around there. Let's call it there, right? It seems to go short to long. There's 97. There's 82. So somewhere between 80 and 100 microseconds. It actually has quite a bit of jitter going on, but let's call that reaction time somewhere in the, eh, we'll say 80 to 100 microseconds. Let's measure that pulse width. Again, it's wiggling around a bunch, so it's kind of hard to say, but we'll call it about 66 microseconds. And the jitter, so the time from when the input goes up to the output goes up and the, the variation in that, that's going to be even harder to measure here. But the last falling one seems to be somewhere right around in here. So 270, but we have to subtract out that pulse width somewhere right out in here. So that's 400. We want to subtract off 60. So let's call it a jitter of, I don't know, somewhere around 350. Okay, so let me go compile this into a table so that it makes uh, some sense so that we can look at it all side by side. And I'll be right back. So here's all the data collected in one location. With the F7 feather, you can see the reaction time is slower than the others. Pulse width is about the same as a Pi Zero. Jitter is about the same. So it's similar to the Pi Zero, but a little bit slower in reaction. The Pi 5 is not surprisingly much, much faster because it's got a much faster processor. And then the Arduino, again, I've got a star by it because this is not managed code and not running an operating system. So you really can't compare apples to apples there. Now, if you look at this, you go, oh, well, obviously I'd use the Pi 5 because it's faster. Well, that's not always the story. That's not always the case. If you looked at the power consumption and the heat generation of all of these, you're going to find a significant difference. This Pi 5 is a, you know, it's a panini press on the desk already. It's quite warm. Whereas the Feather generates very, very little heat. It also uh, requires very little power. I would not even want to try running a Pi 5 on a battery, not for any length of time. The Zero 
is much better for performance uh, as far as power consumption and heat generation, but again, it's still not fantastic. The Feather is probably better than both of those. So these are some data points for making decisions. These are not what you would just go, oh, well, this is absolutely what I want to use. There are a whole bunch of other factors that you want to take a look at when you're building your solution. Again, these are just data points. I think that the most interesting thing about all of this is the code for these top three was nearly identical. And in fact, for the two Raspberry Pis, it is identical uh, code and identical binaries. I copied the same binary for both of them and uh, got different results. So that's all I've got for today. If this is the type of content you'd like to see more of, let me know. Otherwise, if you'd like to see something else, also let me know down in the comments. At any rate, thanks for watching.